Hey, I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So over the weekend, the Dititat, Huayet, and Pachidat First Nations delivered a message to the British Columbia government. They said they're planning to hold off on the logging of old-growth trees in the areas of Ferry Creek and Central Walbran for two years while they come up with long-term plans. This is the latest development in a standoff that's been ongoing since last summer between protesters who've been calling for a moratorium on industrial logging of ancient forests on the southwestern side of Vancouver Island and a forestry company called Teal Jones. The protesters say the old growth trees in the majestic Fairy Creek watershed need to be left alone, that they're crucial to preserving the biodiversity of the area and to the fight against climate change. But to Teal Jones, old growth trees are valuable for a different reason. They produce what's considered specialty wood. And not logging in this area could mean the company could lose $20 million. The protests at Fairy Creek have been getting more attention in recent weeks, since the BC Supreme Court granted Teal Jones an injunction in April, saying that they had the legal right to log the area uninterrupted. The RCMP recently started enforcing that injunction and arresting protesters. As of Monday, they made 172 arrests. What makes this a bit complicated is that Fairy Creek falls on the traditional territories of the Pachidat First Nation, which has its own relationship to the forestry industry and has itself been divided over the issue of old growth logging. Fairy Creek also happens to be in BC Premier John Horgan's riding, and he's been under tremendous pressure from all sides to do something. The New Democrats have always struggled with the divide between kind of their environmental caucus and their labor caucus. Justine Hunter is The Globe's BC legislative reporter based in Victoria, and she's been covering the tensions around harvesting old growth forests for decades. She's going to bring us up to speed, and we'll talk about where this conflict could be headed. That's today on The Decibel. Hi, Justine. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So, Justine, I know you've actually been to the protest camps. Can you describe what they look like? Yeah, we're talking about uh, an area of Vancouver Island that has uh, this is sort of broadly the San Juan watershed on southern Vancouver Island. And you go as you're driving in there, there's, you know, there have been logging operations in these areas for decades upon decades. Some of them are reforested and, you know, you've got even 80-year-old stands of trees that look like a, an old forest, but they're nothing like it. And then you get into these pockets of real ancient forests, which feel very different. Mm-hmm. And they're, you know, rich in biodiversity. And, uh, you know, you're following along on tracks that have been cut through by Roosevelt elk and not a lot of humans have been there. It's quite amazing. So you get into these areas, you follow this logging road up and uh, there are, uh, I visited just one of the protest sites while they were doing arrests at the headlands of the Ferry Creek. Mm-hmm. They've had, obviously, these protesters have been set up there for since last August. So they've got well-established set up. Uh, they've got a big bus up there. I don't know how they got it up that logging road. It's not an easy one to drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, at that point, there were people chained together and another person dressed in a bear costume, which must have been quite warm on that day, uh, embedded in some concrete so that uh, it would be very slow to remove them. And the police were had this operation going on where they were very slowly, methodically removing the protesters. Now, one of the things I'll say is that day that I was up there, there were cameras there, there were people witnessing what was going on with the arrests. But you remember that there are pockets of activists in different parts, some of them up in trees. I'm about 150 feet up. My job here is to protect these trees, and to protect this forest. And a lot of these arrests are taking place outside of kind of that public forum where you can record and see what's going on. So it's a, a little bit different than covering some of the other protests I've, I've seen over the years here in BC. Mm-hmm. And who are these protesters and why have they been blockading this area? The group is calling themselves the Rainforest Flying Squad, and they have been up there since last summer. 
in Tree Farm License 46. So not just Ferry Creek, but a number of other cut blocks. And on an individual basis, the protesters may have different reasons for being out there. But collectively, the objective is to change government policy. So it's not to stop logging per se, but to stop cutting down what's left of BC's old growth forests. These really big, iconic giants, those cedars that are a thousand years old or more, they happen to grow best in those wet valleys on Bay. BC's coast. And in this area, the San Juan watershed in particular, there are just some amazing pockets of old growth that haven't been logged. So the protest is, you know, they have picked a line in the sand. Their rallying cry is to protect this one untouched valley, this Ferry Creek watershed. But more broadly, what they're trying to do is to get decision makers to stop logging ancient forests in BC. Yeah, yeah. So the crux of this issue is the old growth trees, which according to the BC government, I believe there are any trees that are at least 250 years old. So why are old growth trees so important? Well, there's a couple of things. If you're in the forest industry, they are an important part of the revenue stream. And for British Columbia, uh, at a time when the economy has been stalled in a, a number of areas, because of the pandemic, forestry is actually a huge part of uh, the provincial government's revenues. And it's expected to go up dramatically. Uh, I think this budget this year was uh, $1.5 billion just in direct forest revenues. Now, for other values, for environmental values, for biodiversity, they're also Mm -hmm. exceptionally important. Some of these forests that we're talking about here on the coast, where you have not just trees that are a thousand or sometimes even 2000 years old, but those forests, those systems have been there for thousands of years without any fundamental disruption. In terms of climate change, there's a lot of interest in, in protecting them because they're an important part of uh, Canada's ability to combat climate change as mm-hmm. carbon sinks. So uh, Canada is right now in the middle of, they put in their last budget, billion to fund protected areas as part of their biodiversity and climate change program. And uh, so there's an interest federally as well in in seeing Mm -hmm. some of these areas protected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's important to note that the Indigenous communities that have uh, considered these part of their cultural um, practices to harvest some of these trees uh, also have a stake in this. Mm -hmm. If old growth trees are so important for biodiversity and if intact old growth forests are so crucial to the fight against climate change, why can't Teal Jones use other kinds of trees? Why focus on old growth forests? Yeah, that is an interesting debate because BC is running out of old growth. So more and more of the harvest is second growth forests. But The old growth is the most valuable thing. So what you get is a mix of harvest. So for example, Teal Jones, yes, they cut down a lot of second growth, but they also, they make a lot of money off those really special big old trees. This is all playing out as we're seeing record-breaking lumber prices in North America because of supply chain issues caused by the pandemic and because there's been a rise in demand for lumber from homeowners. So how does that factor into what's happening now at Ferry Creek? Well, there's certainly the government is um, seems to be in no hurry to resolve some of these issues around old growth. So they have been talking, the NDP have been talking since 2017 when they first formed a a minority government about making some changes to protect old growth. They campaigned in it in the last election as well. And what they did is they set up a panel, they had reviews, they had endless versions of consultation. And even now in 2021, they're now saying, well, now we have to do some more consultation with Indigenous communities to talk about what we do about old growth logging. In the meantime, yeah, there's a huge amount of money to be made. And, uh, you know, every mill that's still left standing is probably running at capacity right now. Mm -hmm. So I just want to flesh out something that you just said. Um, So ultimately, the protesters want the BC government to halt all old growth logging. And last fall during the provincial election, John Horgan, the BC premier, he promised to accept the recommendations of this expert panel that called for the protection of old growth forests. So where does he stand now? And is he 
I guess, delivering on that election promise. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is this is very, and I'm not saying this just because I'm a political reporter, but this is a very political story. So I want to take you back to that snap election in October. So uh, at that time, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The, the premier decides to call an election because he wants to get rid of this minority government, which he feels is slowing him down. He wants a majority for his NDP. So at that time, he goes into the campaign. He says he will fully adopt the recommendations from an independent expert panel that was calling for this paradigm shift in the province's management of old growth forests, one that recognizes that those trees can be worth more standing up than they are harvested. Now, why did John Horgan make that promise? Well, because he was trying to get rid of the BC Greens, their partners in the minority government. Mm -hmm. But in order to secure a majority government, what he needed to do was win over those voters who might be leaning towards the Green Party. And that was the path to growing the NDP's base. So yes, he said, I will uh, protect old growth forests. It was part of their campaign. They advertised on it. And then you get, they've got this majority now. They won. The Green Party lost the leverage it had enjoyed in the previous minority government. But now the Premier's got all these expectations that there would be some tangible change in forest practices. And what they've done very, so far has been very slow, very incremental. And if anything, his commitment has become kind of a weapon for his critics who say, mm. you know, you, you, you won an election based on a promise to do things differently. And what we have right now is mostly status quo. Yeah. And I know last week, the BC government released the details of this plan to modernize the forest industry. What does that look like? Yeah. So what BC did is they released an intentions paper on June 1st. And it mostly deals with who gets to cut down trees on Crown land. It's not so much about which trees we cut down. So there's five big forestry companies in BC that hold about half of the timber harvesting rights in BC, and that's about to change. So what this uh, change does is it will establish new powers so the province can redistribute logging rights on timber land. So this is all about tenure. And the idea is to shift more harvesting rights to smaller timber companies, but particularly to Indigenous nations. Um, so right now, uh, BC's Indigenous communities have the rights to about 10% of the annual harvest. And in two years from now, they should have about 20% of the annual harvest. Now, the idea is to squeeze more jobs out of a declining number of trees. Um, they are going to increase penalties for bad actors, and they're going to use forestry as a mechanism for reconciliation with First Nations. But what it doesn't do is it will not end the practice of harvesting ancient forests. And that's being dealt with in this parallel plan, this old growth timber review, uh, and that's still working its way through uh, Indigenous consultations. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. the critics say this package really just cements the status quo. And this logging and protests are happening on the lands of the Pachidat First Nation. And I know their position on this has evolved since the beginning. So can you tell me about what the leaders of this First Nation are saying about what should happen? Yeah, first of all, the Pachidat are at the center of it because Fairy Creek falls into their traditional territories. But really, there are three First Nations that have been caught in the crossfire here of this protest. So it's the Pachidat, the Dididat, and the Hoyat. They're all First Nations on the west coast of Vancouver Island. They All these nations depend on forestry revenues. They have either partnerships or revenue sharing agreements. But the official line from the Pachidat, the Dididat, and the Hoyat is that, you know, for the past 150 years, they have had almost no say in what happens to the resources of their lands. But we're in a different era now. There's the legal landscape has changed. Government and industry can't ignore them anymore, in part because of case law, but also because the provincial government has adopted the principles of UNDRIP. That's the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. What that means is the government needs to seek free prior and informed consent from Indigenous peoples before making decisions on resource development. So they do have some serious authority here. On June 5th, the three nations came out together and said they are the decision makers. They've told the province that what they want to do is defer logging in Ferry Creek and in some other contentious areas. Now, that is not the entire 
uh, area of logging that's in dispute. It's kind of, Ferry Creek is the very center of it, but there's logging going on all over and the blockades are not confined just to Ferry Creek proper. It's just kind of the rallying cry. Mm -hmm. So the other thing they've done is they've said to the protesters, do not interfere with logging operations elsewhere in our traditional territories. So the official position is we are going to put a pause on some of these logging operations while we work out our own resource planning. But in the meantime, they want the protesters to, they say, you can go ahead and protest, but you cannot interrupt and disrupt these uh, logging operations, which our communities depend on. Mm -hmm. And I know that there were uh, people from the community who were also part of the blockades, like an elder named Bill Jones. He supports the blockades and he says that the protesters are there at his invitation. So this most recent development, does that mean that there is more of a consensus on this issue? There's definitely uh, debates going on within those communities, and it's been made very difficult for them to kind of deal with that internal debate when you got all of these pressures coming from government, from industry, from the public. But there's also pressure um, within Indigenous communities more broadly. And I spoke uh, recently with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. He's the head of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. He's one of the voices saying that what what is happening here is that governments and companies are kind of trapping First Nations into uh, buying into what's going on with old growth logging when they should be protecting old growth. So what he's proposing is that the governments come to the table with some money to help Indigenous communities find other ways to benefit from their lands. And what are some other examples of what benefiting from that land could look like? Well, you've got uh, areas in Canada where you've got Indigenous protected areas, essentially where the the local indigenous community is uh, in charge of running, you know, whether it's a park or, or um, you know, just making sure that the uh, land is kept intact and protected from resource development. And that can create jobs in terms of uh, ecotourism, for example. You see a lot of that in the Great Bear Rainforest, for example, where uh, indigenous communities are you know, benefiting in terms of jobs and handling um, eco-based management of those territories without cutting down the last old growth trees. Given that BC has passed legislation to implement UNDRIP, which is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and these First Nations have now said that they want to see all logging activity in Ferry Creek and the Central Walbrand area is deferred for two years. What does this actually mean? Does it mean that the government has to make Teal Jones stop its activity? I think in effect, yes. They, the government could say, no, we're not going to do that. But I, I just think that's unfathomable. They, they will have to uh, defer logging in those two areas. Mm -hmm. And there are people inside the NDP, like MLA Taylor Bockrack, who has tweeted in support of the goals of the protests. And I'm wondering, how strong is the push from inside the NDP for John Horgan to do more? And I guess, like, what kinds of pressure is he dealing with when he's making these decisions? The New Democrats have always struggled with the divide between kind of their environmental caucus and their labor caucus. And, you know, this was a defining feature of the, the NDP government of the 1990s as well. You know, it's one thing to say what well, we can create jobs and protect the environment. But in practice, especially around issues like resource development, it can be very difficult to find the right balance. And so you've got pressure for sure uh, within New Democrats that would like to see this issue of old growth logging go away and for the government to meet its commitments to protect old growth forests. The details, though, um, one of the reasons why it's taking so long is that you cannot do this. You cannot make these decisions without Indigenous input. And at the same time that we're talking about um you know, deferring logging in different areas, you always have to remember that there are First Nations that have a stake in that and that want to have a say and they want to be at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, John Horgan was asked about this and he said that the critical re recommendation at play is consulting with title holders. And this is recommendation from that report from the independent panel of experts that we mentioned earlier. So he said, if we were to arbitrarily put deferrals in place there, that would be a return to the colonialism that we have so graphically been brought back to as a result of issues in Kamloops this week. I'm not.
So essentially, he's saying that the government can't just unilaterally decide to ban old growth logging if the First Nation wants it to continue. That's right. And I think he picked a very unfortunate way of framing that. But it is a question of the government's commitment to uphold the principles of UNDRIP. And that means that they need to not be coming in and telling the Pachadat, the Dididat, the Hoyat, and all those other nations around the province how things are going to happen. They have to work with those nations to come up with something that satisfies their resource planning. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that we saw a similar conflict play out in the 1990s between the environmentalist wing of the NDP and the labor wing. Can you tell me what happened in the 90s and like what that was all about? Yeah, so that was the big conflict. It was called the first war in the woods at Clackwatt Sound. And, you know, the roots of the issue at Ferry Creek and Clackwatt Sound are very similar. So you had these blockades, people trying to stop old growth logging, mass arrests, civil disobedience. Uh, in, in Clackwatt, you had almost a thousand people that were arrested. And it was all about putting pressure on government to do something different. And in both cases, you had an NDP government that was elected on a promise to protect old growth forests and then fell short of expectations. Mm. So at Clackwatt, you had uh, an NDP government that was trying to come up with a land solution uh, that did not um, did not appease their environmental base, and it certainly didn't appease people in Clackwatt Sound. And I think that's why the NDP tend to trigger these really big explosions of civil disobedience. Uh, you know, they're not. Um, you know, they when they do get into power, which isn't all that often. There's just huge expectations that they will be environmental activists and that they will make up these massive changes in how we exploit resources. But the reality is when jobs are on the table, it's not easy for the NDP to be green because, they, you know, their labor base says you don't just put logging operations, uh, shutter them down and, and put jobs at risk. Okay, so now that the Pachidat First Nation wants to see all logging activity in the area deferred for two years, where do you see this going? Yeah, so the, what, what they're talking about is a deferral specific to, to a couple of spots. So they're not saying logging should be deferred right throughout the area, right? So there will still be logging done under their plan. But uh, where it goes, the federal government has this huge amount of money that was in the budget uh, quite recently, $2.3 billion. Uh, now, that's right across the country, but it's to protect lands that are important for bio biodiversity and the climate. So, and, you know, the, the G7 nations have just come out and declared that the climate crisis is tied to a crisis in the loss of biodiversity. What Canada has said is they, their contribution to helping the planet uh, is to set aside 25% of our lands in protected areas. And that's by 2025. And by 2030, we would have 30% of our lands in protected areas. So BC's old growth forests are really important to that. Uh, BC and Canada could work together in consultation with First Nations to figure out where those lands should be protected. But clearly the old growth forests are going to be, what's left of them will be uh, a, an important part of that larger solution. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and just a little bit of context, we've been doing industrial scale logging here in British Columbia for 80 years or more. And most of the valuable timber on the coast is already being harvested. A lot of it's gone. So we're talking about, as somebody said in a recent report I read, we're talking about the white rhinoceros of the uh, of our forests that are just left. And that's that's kind of where that debate goes is where do where how where do you draw the line and say we're going to, you know, put something in place that will protect that last uh, little bit of land. Mm -hmm. Great. Justine, thank you so much for helping me make sense of all of this. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it for today. I'm Tamara Kandacker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovic. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thank you so much to Justine Hunter. You can find more of her work at theglobeandmail.com. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to say hello or let us know what you want us to cover next, you can email us at thedecibel at globamail.com. You can also tweet me at anima underscore TK. And most importantly, wherever you listen to podcasts, follow us so you don't miss a single episode. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.